My name is Marcus Antonius, a centurion in the legions of Rome, but stationed in Judea. For 25 years, I have faithfully served my emperor. Rising up from the lowest of ranks, I became a captain of 100 men in a regiment of 5,000. I have fought in more battles than I care to remember, in lands such as Greece, Persia, and Carthage. My blade has shed the blood of hundreds in the field of battle, and I learned to fear nothing and no one. But to be stationed in Judea, my sword will shed the blood of too many Judeans. And there is no honor in that. For they have no army, no force to face in the field of battle. They were simply a difficult, pathetic, and backward country that hadn't the sense to bow before the throne of Caesar. Other nations had accepted Caesar's rule. Other people had bowed to the authority of Rome. But not these Jews. Not these Jews. We knew it was their religion, their faith in the one holy and righteous God that made their backs like iron and made it impossible for them to bow their knees. Privately, we speculated that we might have to destroy their very temple before they would bow to Caesar. They were a bitter, harsh, and unkind people. But to be fair to them, not all of them were. Some of them were kind to us, and some of them were good. Many of these were the ones who listened to the instructions of a rabbi known as Jesus. We Romans laughed about this Jesus. To us, he was little more than an itinerant preacher who had nothing better to do with his time than to travel about the countryside preaching about peace and love. We Romans know that peace came by the edge of the sword. And love? Love was something to be purchased. We were men of the world. We understood these things. To us, Jesus was nothing more than a simpleton and a fool. Lucius, however, didn't agree with us. Lucius was my friend and a fellow centurion. And he told me the strangest tale. It seems that one of his servants became sick and was paralyzed and racked with great pain. And Lucius was beside himself because this was his favorite servant. But then he heard about this rabbi, who not only preached about peace and love, but rumor had it could heal a man by simply touching them. The crippled were made to walk, the blind to see, and lepers were made whole again. So my friend sought out this Jesus, and he finally found him in a dirty backwater town. My servant, he said, is sick and in great pain. Will you come with me and heal him? And Jesus replied, Yes, I will come with you at once and heal him. But then Lucius boldly said, No, that will not be necessary, for I am a man of authority. I tell one man, do this, and another, do that. You have simply to say the word, and my servant will be healed. Then Lucius told me that Jesus stared into his eyes and marveled. Never in all of Israel have I seen such faith. Return home, and it shall be as you have said. Then Lucius told me at that very hour of the day, his servant rose up from his bed and was completely healed. Did this really happen? <coughs> I didn't know. 
I, too, am a religious man. And in my religion, there are many stories of great healings and miraculous occurrences, most of which I knew were false. So what did I know? But then I met this Jesus. He had been arrested the night before and brought up before the leaders of his people. They accused him of being a heretic. They said he claimed to be the Son of God. And they condemned him to death. But since Judea was under the authority of Rome, they didn't have the authority to execute him legally. So they brought him before Pontius Pilate, the governor of the region. They accused him of being a traitor to Rome. They said he claimed to be the king of Israel. And that he challenged the authority of Caesar himself. This was a crime worthy of death on the cross. And if Pilate didn't crucify him, he was no friend of Caesar's. I was present when Jesus entered the room. From the moment that he stepped foot through the door, I knew something wasn't right. Pilate was a man who had sent hundreds of prisoners to their death. I had seen him sentence men to be crucified without even flinching. But as the interrogation proceeded, it became increasingly apparent that Pilate wasn't judging this Jesus. Jesus was judging Pilate. Pilate's unease only grew when his wife burst into the room and dragged him to the corner, warning him in soft tones not to have anything to do with this Holy One, that she had had a dream about him that very night. Pilate sought to spare Jesus the pain of the cross, and he instructed me to take him outside to the outer courtyard and have him flogged. Flogging was one of the most hard, or it was a punishment usually reserved for the most hardened criminals. 30, 40, 50 lashes, and a man's skin would hang in strips from his chest and his back. One out of every three men who were flogged died from this punishment. When we finished, my soldiers began to mock him. They put a purple robe on his shoulders and fashioned a crown of thorns and shoved it on his head. Hail, king of the Jews, they cried. Then they blindfolded him and spat on him and struck him. Prophesy, O Son of God, who was it that struck you? But Jesus never spoke. He never uttered a word. He stood there as one who still had the authority of a man of power. Finally, I returned this Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate, thinking to gain the sympathies of the crowd, led this man out with his terribly beaten body before them. What would you have me do with this Jesus who is called the Christ? He asked. The chief priests and the Pharisees went out amongst the people, and they whispered, Crucify him! Crucify him! And the crowd cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And at last, though Pilate was still uneasy about this Jesus, he feared the crowd more and ordered me to take him outside the city walls to a place called Golgotha and put him on a cross. Crucifixion was one of the most cruel and terrible forms of execution known to man. Now at one time, Rome required its common soldiers to place men on the cross. But they soon discovered that this so demoralized the troops that they finally took to selecting one man who was the executioner. This was a man of great strength, so that with one blow, he could drive the nails through the flesh 
into the wood. Roman soldiers who were assigned the duty to stand guard over those who were being crucified often took to drinking large amounts of strong drink in order to dull their senses. One soldier wrote, Of all the sounds in hell, none is more pitiable than those terrible cries heard through the silence of the midnight, where crucified men hang in their agony and cannot die while a breath of suffering remains. When men were being put on the cross, many of them would spit on us and curse us and threaten us and our families. But we knew their threats were meaningless. Once they were put on the cross and raised to the sky, they would not come back down alive again. But Jesus was different. He never spat on us or threatened us or cursed us. Like a lamb being led to the slaughter, he never opened his mouth. Then at one point during the day, he pushed himself up on his feet, which were pinned to the cross, and he drew in a breath of air and cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They know not what they do. Initially, I joined in the mocking and taunting of this Jesus. But then the darkness came. It was noonday, and the sun should have filled the sky. But instead, darkness came down like a curtain, and the crowd scurried away. My own soldiers began to shrink back from his cross. For three hours, darkness reigned upon the face of the earth. Then at last, he pushed himself up again and drew one last gasp of air and cried out, It is finished. And then he died. No sooner had he died than the ground beneath our feet began to shake and my men fell to their knees. I looked up at the cross and the man on it, and I said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Three days later, it was rumored that this Jesus rose from the dead. Some of my own soldiers told me they were there when the earth shook again and the stone rolled back from the grave and no one was to be found in the tomb. Over 500 men were said to have seen the resurrected Christ. But I was a Roman. I worshipped many gods. So even if this man was a god, he would have simply been one of many. But I couldn't remove his words from my heart. Or, his, or the events of the day from my mind. I couldn't shake the reality that I was guilty of this innocent man's blood. I had been the one authority. It was I who had ordered his execution. Several years later, I encountered a man with the same name as myself. Mark. A follower of Jesus. A Christian, he called himself. And I shared with him the experiences I had had the day of Jesus' crucifixion. He told me that Jesus had indeed been the Son of God. That he, his death had not been an accident, but was instead the very will of God and that he had died to take away the guilt and shame of man's sin. I was guilty, he said, of Jesus' death. But not because I put him on the cross, 
It was my sin and selfishness and arrogance and pride that had put him on the cross. I knew at once that what this Christian told me was true. And so I did the very thing that those Jews couldn't do long ago before Caesar. I knelt before Jesus. I bowed my will to him. I died to the man I used to be and allowed myself to be buried with the waters of baptism as he had been buried many years before. And I rose from my grave as he rose from his. I had become a new man, a soldier now for Christ. There is perhaps no story that, uh, that I appreciate about the crucifixion than this story about the Roman centurion. The outsider, if you will, the one that uh, did not have all of the stories growing up of the coming Messiah. And yet he acknowledged back in this story that I just restated that he understood the authority that Jesus had. He didn't need Jesus to physically come to the location to heal the servant. And nor do we. But this message, this, this message, this crucifixion, this cross, this resurrection, this Easter Sunday, this is a message for all of us for all time. For those of us that have a relationship with Christ, it is a reminder of what he did for us that day on the cross. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus at this point, I pray that you consider it today. Now, if you've been around here these last two weeks, you've heard me say this, uh, but I'm going to say it again. If you don't know Christ and you're thinking about pushing it off another day, Scripture tells us, no, today is the day of salvation. I would greatly encourage you, if you want to know more about who this Jesus is and what he's meant to me or to anyone in this congregation, I'd encourage you to come talk with me. We've got a few deacons around here that would be more than happy to to talk with you after the service. So thank you again for being here. We're going to turn now to our time of communion. So just a couple short days before Easter, and something we do around here the first week of the month is is to honor what uh, Jesus' words at the Last Supper. So if you recall, shortly before he was arrested and taken to the cross, he was sitting around a table with his disciples. And they were eating, and he pulled out, took out a piece of bread, or a loaf of bread, and broke it. And he held it up. And I don't think his disciples had any idea of what was to come in the way that it came. We get that pretty clearly through other pieces of scripture. But he came that night, and he told them that this represented his body. And that as often as they gather they were to eat of it in remembrance of Jesus' body. Take and eat. And after doing that, He took the cup, and he said to them, this blood represents, this represents, this cup represents my blood. 
And just as you meet together, again, do this in remembrance of me. Drink ye all. If you would please stand, uh, I'm going to give a benediction and then there will be one more closing song. Um, I want to thank you again for coming. Uh, you are welcome here anytime. We have a Sunday school, adult Sunday school at 9.15 each week, uh, along with our regular service here at 10 o'clock. May the peace of Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Remember, church, you are sent. <laughs>